Hello everyone, this is another Poetry Thursday video, although by the time that it's filmed and uploaded, it's going to be Saturday. My apologies for the delay, I had work and family things to take care of. But no, we're back. And so now today I want to read one of my favorite odes by John Keats, a Ode on a Grecian Urn. Ode on a Grecian Urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvan historian, who canst thus express A flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape Of deities or mortals, or of both, In temp or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels, what wild ecstasy. Heard melodies are sweet. Those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but, more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal, Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade. Though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs, I cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, Leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies, And all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore, Or mountain built with peaceful citadel, Is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And, little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain, in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. So the main concept of an ode is the opportunity for the poet to sing the praises or to rhapsodize over a particular object or a phenomenon. And so in this case, it is a Grecian urn. Uh, it doesn't really matter what, uh, the what the Grecian urn looks like um, if we don't have a photo of the actual urn that Keats saw that inspired the poem itself. The important value in this poem is the sincere love 
that inspires and drives his imagination to then sing of the imagined paradises in the poem, right? And those are what build and persuade him to say with conviction the last lines, truth is beauty and beauty truth, right? It's not so much the axiom itself, truth is beauty, that's important. It's the journey that he took to get there. It's the underlying sentiment that supports that. And you can tell odes to announce the subject and to make, to um, share with the reader the relation that the poet has to the object. They'll announce it in this like grand entrance. In this case, you know, this, this urn, which is just to the unknowing or unfeeling eye is a piece of pottery. For Keats, it is a unravished bride of quietness. It's a foster child of silence and slow time. It's a sylvan historian. And that's just in the first three lines. It's like when you have a herald of the court announcing the entrance of a king and they take their scroll and read off the list of titles, you know, king of blank, lord of blank, victor in the battles of blank, 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 right? What that initial thing, he's bringing the object of the poem to sit at the pedestal so we may view it at the same light at the, and at the same height as the poet does. We get immediately, so one of the occurring themes in this poem is um, permanence and how it relates to uh, art. And one of these permanent aspects of the urn is its ability to speak of a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. In the second stanza, it says, Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. And so, of course, that makes you first think, how can a silent urn be as like a mute uh, storyteller and yet deliver us sensations that are sweeter than music. I say it's because the scene on the, um, on the urn, this pastoral scene, has the same effect on the imagination as music does, but it affects us more deeply because with music, we're kind of guided by the artist, by the person playing the instrument through a predetermined uh, measure through a predetermined song, right? So we kind of are at the mercy of the artist to take us where we need to go. It's here, and so, and we're limited in that way, right? We can't, if a song begins a certain way and plays a few notes, it can't end how we want it to end. It's going to end the way that the musical artist determines. Whereas in this scene, we're given, it kind of serves as like a signpost for our imagination. And so they gives us a scene and we can kind of make up the rest of the story, make up, play the rest of the music to how we want to, to how, to how our soul desires it. And so that's how it affects us more deep. It's more personal. So the permanence in this art, the, un, the uh, unspoken permanence is that it, in this scene is that it freezes passion in its prime, right? This scene, imagine seeing their youth, and a bold lover, they're in love. And although, uh, you know, though they never can thou kiss, they will always be in love and the love will always be fair. So, and I think that's also, and Keats talks about that the greatest poets um, delight in the light and dark and in the high and the low. And so do you hear the silver lining in that stanza you have Okay, so maybe the fair youth, you'll never be able to wrap your arms around the portrayed uh, lover, the portrayed fair underneath the boughs, but she will always be there and she will always be young. And so, you know, what? it's bittersweet. And on top of that, more on the sweeter side, these, the tree, the leaves, these are happy, happy boughs and a happy melodious, you know, ever new. And this love will always be in this scene, a happy love, and it's undying. And it's this passion that's portrayed in the scene is a human passion, right? If you've been in love, you can say, ah, yes, 
the scene is a remembrance, but then it's idealized because it never ends. Whereas our experience tells us, yes, even the best of love is temporary and there has an expiration date. But yet this one, this scene speaks of a human passion which breathes far above. And it's at the prime of it. It's not like a weak kind of love. It's like love unmitigated in its fullest extent that'll, that has a physical effect on the body, right? Something mental, emotional has a physical effect on the body. That's how strong it is. Where it leaves the heart high sorrowful and cloyed and a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Although love might be this kind of like imagined, ungraspable uh, something, like something in the air, it's really felt more palpable. And it's given a solidity through its effects on our body. So then he turns to a new scene in the fourth stanza. And this might be a scene on the same urn, maybe on the different side of it, or he might be um, compiling various scenes on various urns and kind of making a composite image to rhapsodize about. Um, it really doesn't matter, right? This is just him, again, expressing his love for the pottery. And um, so we have one scene is of the lovers underneath the tree. This new scene is now a train of priests and the followers, um, likely of the Greek god Hecate, uh, who are going to traveling on their way to a green altar. And this is where you can see Keats's imaginative power. He sees in images, not just the explicit, like, yes, okay, it's a picture of a priest and their train. But in that image, there's so much implied. There's first, they're in motion. So it's where they have to go, which is a, um, a par like kind of a, a romanticized paradise in the future, which is that green altar. But also, where did they come from? And there, there's the um, romanticized past. Because he imagines seeing if there must be people outside of doors and there must be homes that are empty of people, of families. And so that's when he feels for the little town who's been emptied of the folk who give really the town itself. You can't have a town without the people. And so it says, and little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be and not a soul to tell thy uh, why thou art desolate can ever return. Kind of like he looks more and more into, and that's on his desires, right? The, the, the artist who painted the urn didn't paint those scenes on the urn. That was his extra step, his desire that made that travel into his imagination. And so then the fifth stanza, we kind of say, we, do, we make a similar refrain as those beginning titles in the first stanza. Now we go back to rhapsodizing on the urn itself. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought. And now this, we're kind of having a summarizing ode. And he ties up very well, very clearly and succinctly the effect that this art has on us. This urn's essence, whose, which can be felt by the impression that it makes on us, on our heart and our soul. And what it does to us is although it's a silent form, doth tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral, right? It is, it is as eternity, as a kind of immovable, undisruptible vision. It's this kind of scene that shows us as a pastoral past that always, that did exist and always will exist, captured in the urn. And it will continue to live on past when Keats wrote the poem and when we're reading the poem and for generations later, he's, see, he's seeing this the eternal aspect of the urn. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe that ours are friend to man. And then this is so he sees that beauty, which doesn't die, the immortal aspect, that immortality of it, the, the eternal aspect of it is what gives it its truth. Right, it's not something fleeting, but it's here and it's been felt. And so beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. And to close out the, you know, this video and this poem, I don't, like I said in the beginning, I don't think it's the right decision if you really focus too much on those last lines, because people see this as just kind of like a quick, um, like Keats's doctrine to beauty and to truth. 
I don't think he ever had a doctrine. Um, he said it himself that any axiom that was stated, it must be proved on the pulses, right? It must be have a living uh, experiential reality to it to be true. He, he, and he confesses in his letters that he felt the beauty in poetry could be just some kind of show, like of a jack, he says a jack-o'-lantern, a kind of um, shadow show to kind of distract someone of its brilliance away from like the reality of human experience. And so he never fully was convinced of anything really. I mean, he, he just knew he was skeptical. The only thing he really knew was that he didn't know. And some of the feeling, the deepest feelings and recurring um, mo movements of his heart. And so I think just to restate, the importance in this poem is the journey of that sincere love took him and his imagination through using the urn as a signpost and taking it to um, the truth of the eternity and beauty that lives in this urn. So that's all I think I have to say for the poem. Um, and thank you for watching.